so this is my current big side project. My side projects tend to be my biggest projects. And it was based on one idea, and it's that we reached peak screen time. I haven't met a single person that says, you know what, I want more technology in my life. I would like to get those screen time hours up. It doesn't exist. Everyone wants to bring them down. Even as these things are delightful in terms of the content we consume on them, we've reached peak screen time. So what does that mean and what becomes the commodity that then we value and then turn towards and aspire to? Well, we think right now it's nature and in the future we think it's gonna be agriculture. And I think we're already starting to see that. Certainly like, you know, terms like glamping are a little tacky now, but there was a start of something, you know, 10 years ago on Pinterest that was very real there. Now we've seen AutoCamp, Getaway, Under Canvas all sort of explode, and we have a term for that, outdoor hospitality. I thought about this in my own sort of way and started investing. My background's in design and architecture, but I don't ever take commissions. I always want to be completely hands-on from construction and fabrication to the financial stack. If I think I'm the most creative person in the room, I want to benefit from that, not be a mercenary. So that leads us to Reset Hotel. Uh, about seven years ago, I started buying land outside of national parks. Uh, we looked at visitorship to national parks and it correlated to Instagram gaining more daily users. And we're like, that kind of makes sense. Most people want to share unoffensive stuff that's a kind of a passive way to virtue signal and nothing uh, does that better than, well, I mean, cat videos do it really well, but landscape and sunsets and hiking is a, is a very acceptable way to do it. So steel frame modular constructions, by no means am I a advocate for any type of construction other than what works for that particular project. I've been doing this too long to believe in silver bullets. There aren't any. It really depends on your team, the location, your budget, and what level of sort of crazy commitment you're willing to make. For things like 3D printing or modular, you have to be pretty sure really early on the project and commit to the process. There's not as many modular manufacturers as there are typical site GCs. So you've got to bet big early and really know what you're doing and not get kind of queasy later and then try to pivot or you're gonna cost yourself a lot of time and money. So this is the, the project. We've so far placed about 14 of the 65 modules. What I do like about, well, I'd say the most important site condition for modular would be interest rates. When interest rates are high, construction lending is expensive, the compression of the timeline becomes more and more important. And two, well, this is why you want your design and engineering teams to be financially invested in the projects. Because they won't resist you on these things that you're pushing. If they have skin in the game, they're gonna be equally invested to figure out how to shave months off this construction timeline. And for us, we do it by having three construction sites. So on site in 29 Palms, right next to the National Park, those mountains are basically the park itself. In a factory just outside of Toronto, Canada, we're doing steel frame modular construction, all laser cut steel, all raw materials going in. We're not buying steel members. We're getting sheet steel, laser cutting it, folding it, welding it with robots, and then we're even forming our own light gauge steel studs that do the infill. And then in my workshop in Joshua Tree, we're testing out all of the ff &E. So we'll build a prototype, in this case, out of rocks that came from the excavation of the construction site itself start testing stuff out onto social media to see what people like in our target demo, basically giving us live content ammunition to test against uh, desired sort of audiences. And it lets us sort of be building the hotel, three different phases of it, all at the same time to again, try to save that money on that construction lending. Again, in, in ZERP, who cares? Take all your time that you want, right? B borrow heavily as, as much as, it you, as you can. But once interest rates gets tough, this is where you have to get really, really innovative. And again, doesn't mean modular is great. It's kind of a pain in the ass. It makes financing a lot more complicated. It makes uh, project management way more difficult, but for a shorter amount of time. So do you have really rugged, robust people 
that can withstand the kind of stress and challenge of everything all at once happening all the time in different locations. If you can do that, there's some advantages. Now, one thing that we do is we like to build in public. It's funny, like, when I look at kind of like the social media channels of a lot of like hotels, even really nice boutique hotels, and they maybe have like 20,000 followers, and you'll look at like, the, they post like a nice picture of a mimosa or like a, uh, a granola yogurt parfait in a nice bowl. And you can tell that they have a social media manager that doesn't know what they're doing. The same way if you went to a restaurant and they had printed inkjet pictures that were laminated of their photos of their food on their menus, you'd be like, well, this is, this is why am I sitting at a place with tablecloths when the menu looks like it's from a food truck? So what we think is important is that you want to show effort. You don't want to just show outcome. And it consistently shows up when we sort of post these things on social media. So we think that design, effort, construction, and fabrication is the best marketing you're gonna have if your people are actually good. Otherwise, you're just gonna take photos that are a little bit better than what the food actually looks like, or a little bit better than the room actually looks because you've brought in extra lighting and stuff like that. And you're gonna kind of Photoshop and filter a lie that the guest eventually sort of finds out. But if you show real people putting in real effort with like passion, conviction, and explanation of process, you're gonna to start to build an audience that understands exactly what they're doing because they understand the intent and narrative behind it. So for example, all this content, which is just our natural process of making the things that are gonna end up in the hotel, it ranges. So about, looks like about 11 million people, unique accounts got reached by that fabrication of the coffee table. That's worth about 30 to $40,000 of ad buy if we were to have a marketing firm sort of do that. The construction stuff, a little bit less, you know, 40 to 50,000 views, somewhere in that kind of range. But it's not the point whether or not which one sort of hit big or not. The point is, if you care about what you're doing, I don't know why people don't make videos of their housekeepers making the bed. Someone making your, the bed for you is an amazing experience. But I digress into the social media. So the first units have landed. They're not just modules, uh, they're like 80 or eight feet wide by 40 feet long, but everything in about the millwork package all the way down to the detailed fabrication is modular. So we worked with uh, Columbia Force Products on their, using their kind of Euro style plywood, which is phenomenal. Because we weren't really sure on what our millwork package should be and we had this compressed timeline that we had to kind of start fabricating on even though we hadn't fully staged out a room or didn't do a model room. So we made it modular as well. So we used kind of a French cleat detail where we could just make a bunch of shelves and stuff like that. In this case, we're partnering with the coffee company Fellow. I don't know if, if uh, I stay in hotels a lot. Even nice hotels have these terrible pod coffee machines that sound like a leaf blower because nothing says like, oh wait, I wanna wake up my partner may still be asleep. Let me hit a button that goes for like a good 30, 40 seconds. And it's not that fast. It's not that intuitive. You don't often hit the button too soon and then you have to put a new pot in or you didn't put the water in. So we're working with Fellow to do all sort of pour over. It's about the same amount of time. We think it's a much better experience. It's obviously a better tasting cup of coffee. But we weren't really sure exactly which equipment we were going to do, right? So it's ability to install these kind of modular rails and then create different CNC plans, have a bunch of plywood on hand, and have an on-site CNC machine where we can update modular cabinetry and millwork that will always fit and always sort of match. We even made the little concrete trays, if you see like right over there, where the little canister of coffee goes and the little spoons. We actually made silicone molds and we used leftover concrete from the foundation pours and we modeled those out of Legos, poured silicone over, and now we make our own trays. They cost about 50 cents each, but they're totally custom, and they feel like everything's laid out for you. The coffee itself will be sort of put into the canisters by the night audit staff. We're trying to compress as much sort of, uh, uh, keep the, basically trying to figure out every way not to keep staff down, but how to keep labor rates up. How do we pay people more to do more? And if people are kind of at the time where it's the least busy, 
have them be part of your food and beverage, have them prep things, have them start to put things into a sous vide bath to get ready for the next day so that you can do your uh, uh, meal prepping all the better. This is some of the early kind of highlights that we've been teasing. That's our coffee setup uh, we're doing with Fellow. And our, we got so many free rocks from the excavation for the foundation, so we're making one of these little coffee tables for every room. This is an interesting partnership, is we don't want to fabricate everything. So wherever we can, where we see a direct-to-consumer company that wants to get their product in front of people, we partner with them. So Solo Stove makes these incredible fire pits. I don't want to fabricate a bunch of custom stainless steel. It would cost more even in retail. So what we said is, we'll build an extension. We'll add value to your product. And what we kind of looked at and as sort of researching the LA market, which is our closest sort of drive-in audience, is we saw the popularity of like Korean barbecue restaurants. And then we looked at a lot of demographic trends and we're like, cooking on a campfire is kind of hard and disappointing. Like, it's very, even like a, a New York strip steak, not the hardest thing to cook, but on a grill at night, difficult. So how do we make it easier? How do we make it more interesting? So again, we take leftover concrete, make a silicone mold. These surrounds go around the solo stove. We got their grill attachment, and we're sort of marketing it as like sort of a Korean barbecue option, which is novel. It feels distinct. It's a new way to interpret camping. It hits a sort of very uh, uh, upwardly mobile sort of demographic in Los Angeles and gives something that no one else sort of has. Also, we don't think you're ever done building. Like, you should always be building. The same way your chef and your restaurant should always be tinkering and innovating and coming up with something new. So we think that your marketing dollars should go to things that are actually valuable, not towards just more content recirculated and more sort of like uh, digital advertisements about your free breakfast. So if we look at like what people travel for and what they want to see, it's things that don't exist anywhere else. So we think installation art. But art can be a little bit fuzzy and ownership groups can be like, ah, we're really just gonna pay for some giant abstract thing that, and they always say, I think my 10 year old could have done that. Um, so we'll try to find like different immersive sort of ways to combine it with programmatic functions for the hotel. So of course, in Joshua Tree, people want to do like yoga and sound baths, right? Okay, we need a space for that. And we're gonna have a budget for installation art that will document, tease throughout sort of videos, and then use to sort of add value to the property. So one of our first installations is actually our yoga studio and sound bath place. So we, oh yeah, we had to build our own sewage treatment plant. We were too big for septic. So we learned how to build a sewage treatment plant, which is pretty challenging and involves uh, the state water board and made, a, made our kind of, uh, uh, permitting process even more fun. But in doing so, I priced out a ton of concrete pipes and culverts and all those things. We're like, oh wow, what if we took a bunch of them? The trees that grow in this area tend to be kind of low to the ground. Can we use those to kind of elevate up a bunch of Palo Verde trees, make this incredible sort of blooming cover that creates a shade structure for the yoga classes? So you'll walk up to it, and it'll look like just a series of sort of monumental concrete columns, but you can weave your way in, and there'll be a little bit of shade canopy, both from the columns themselves and from that. We think we can get this made for about forty-five dollars to $50,000, but we think it's something that will only exist here until other people copy. But for now, it'll create a one-of-one -one space. And by the time someone else copies, we'll be on to our next sort of quarterly installation. So to wrap up modular real quick, um, I think schedule is probably the, like, the main reason to do it. I think it's pretty cost neutral. There's some labor costs in kind of a semi-suburban place outside of Toronto is way cheaper than California, but when you factor in shipping to offset that labor, it kind of washes. It's hard to say in a real concrete way that it's all about sort of a shorter construction process. I believe it is, but we haven't built a counterfactual. And I'm always very suspect when people talk very concretely about estimates. Um, and when we did get it bid out, 
uh, are completely site that was looking at sort of 22 to 24 months. But again, those were estimates that weren't nearly done with the amount of rigor that we did to develop our actual timeline. So potentially, that's an advantage. The complications are much more clear. Financing, way more difficult. It's way easier for a bank to understand the process of taking over a failed construction project from a site GC to another site GC. They've done that before. They know how to do it. Very few banks or lenders have done that with modular things. And what if the, the equipment is proprietary or there's some details about that manufacturing that are, that are specific? So financing right away off the bat is where a lot of these ones die. Um, so you have to have a team that's as creative on the engineering and design side as they are on the sort of financial uh, planning. The permitting is both more complicated and easier at the same time. So the modules are inspected by HCD, so the California State Modular Association, and then our site work is done by the sort of local city, 29 Palms. So we have two jurisdictions, but they don't actually overlap that much. The state in our case, particularly in California, is more predictable than the local. So you can sort of, that's I think an advantage that's unique to California, and particularly if you're doing it in a really sensitive area, is that you deal with a much more stable, longer lasting, higher duration of employee permitting base for things like fire sprinkler and some of these bigger, more kind of structural things. So if you have a very difficult local municipality, you can kind of like shift some of that to the state side. So it's that ability to kind of move and define where your sort of a, uh, a sort of jurisdiction is. It's an interesting option that may or may not you know, work for, for your specific needs. Um, project management, way more intense, but shorter, hopefully. Um, and there's always like weird things that you have to sort of figure out. So you want a team that's like pretty nimble with the spreadsheets, but that still understands construction process so they don't abstract financially too much. So right now it's like, the factory wants to ship like three or four modules at a time. Our crane can install seven in a day. The crane's like $14,000 a day to rent. But these modules are also traveling 2,400 miles, so sometimes they don't all seven, they leave the factory at the same time, but they don't arrive all the same time. And if you keep the truck drivers waiting, it's something like $300 a day. So you have to kind of like figure these things out to kind of like optimize, plan for contingencies, and keep going. So you want a, your, your sort of budget team to be like, to actually enjoy optimization. If you have a bunch of uh, accounting kind of people that see that as just extra work and they just resist it, probably not a great idea. I think it does work with like higher labor costs, like in California is a great example. And in our case, as with the 3D printing, I thought you know a lot of the stuff from, from that uh, presentation resonated. Labor avail availability in Joshua Tree is minimal. Um, so that I think allows us to have a little bit more of a productive sort of a timeline. I would say if you wanna do modular, you're much better served by buying a product than commissioning a new product that you designed you're gonna add a whole bunch of complications, you're gonna probably wanna prototype, and there goes your sort of time window. So, you know, if you see like an off-the-shelf product that looks great, and I think that's why kind of AutoCAM did so well uh, early on with that, is they didn't try to reinvent the trailer. They just said, hey, people like Airstreams, they have an iconic sort of profile, nothing else really matters, and at least for getting to a pretty good scale for outdoor hospitality, it certainly worked. So that's it. If you want to see what we're doing, uh, follow us on Instagram. And yeah, hit me up at any time for the rest of the day for questions. Thanks. Thank you.